So the first thing is uh, regarding uh, the mid-sem exam that is coming up. So 22nd of Feb, uh, as has been informed to you all, uh, we would be having our first midterm. The syllabus will be until what we cover on uh, this Thursday. And the Thursday will also be the last day for my class. OK, so on 22nd, you will have your midterm exam. And uh, <clears throat> from 24th onwards, uh, Professor Vijay Natarajan will take over the class. Is that OK? So that is one thing. The next thing is, uh, you know, this exam will be held in a virtual mode. Uh, which means that, uh, you know, you all be uh, sitting in front of your laptops. The camera will be on, right? And we would be using a software to, you know, proctor you, meaning there will be TAs on our side who will be monitoring your screen, like what you see uh, uh, during your exam and also your face and hand, all those things will be visible to the TA, uh, okay? And uh, you have to, you know, uh, 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 you know, under this in, in vigilation setup, you will have to give your exam and the exam will be held during class hours. OK, so if you have any quick questions with regards to these uh, administrative matters, please let me know. I'd be happy to answer them now. Do you have any questions? Please raise your hand. Uh, yes, Deep, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, this is not regarding the exam, but regarding the project. So can you give us some details about that? Yeah, so we will be releasing the project soon and uh, uh, you know that we can then discuss the details of the what you are supposed to do as part of the project. Is that OK? So the okay. instructions will be relayed via uh, teams. OK. All right, uh, are there any more questions? OK, I don't see any raised hand, so maybe we can uh, uh, continue our uh, discussion from last time. OK, so if you sort of remember, we started discussing this idea of chain maps and uh, let me sort of remind you why we were discussing this chain maps. OK, so the idea was we wanted to, you know, at the end discuss this concept called as this mayor vitoris uh, uh, theorem, right? So this is what we wanted to discuss and uh, by the end of today's class, uh, uh, you know, um, we will state this theorem and hopefully we'll also be able to appreciate why we had to do so much background work, right? So let's quickly recall uh, uh, what we did last time. So we spoke about this concept called as chain maps, right? So what is a chain map? Well, a chain map is a function which goes from one chain complex to the other. So what does that mean? Okay, so let X be a sequence of vector spaces. In particular, this is a chain complex. Right, and uh, Y is a sequence of vector spaces which together forms a chain complex, right? So when we say it's a chain complex, it means that, you know, you have these sequence of vectors listed in this form and you have a, a, a boundary operator, okay? Or I shouldn't say boundary operator. There is a vector space homomorphism, okay? That goes from Xn plus one to Xn and Fn goes from Xn to Xn minus one and so on. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> these, uh, 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 these uh, vector space homomorphisms should satisfy the property that if you apply F successively, then the output is zero, right? So this, uh, 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 you know, this uh, sequence of vector spaces along with this vector space homomorphisms together form a chain complex, right? So this is something there on the top, okay? And then similarly, we have another chain complex at the bottom. So each of these YNs uh, uh, is a vector space and between them, we have these vector space homomorphisms and this also satisfies the property that if you apply G successively, then, uh, you know, uh, 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 you get the zero uh, chain, uh, zero element, right, of these uh, uh, vector spaces. All right. Okay, so now what we are doing is we are sort of taking this chain complex. We are taking this chain complex and in some sense, we are trying to define a map between these chain complexes, right? So we will say phi is a map that goes from X to Y. So X is a chain complex. Okay, so this is what uh, uh, X is representing. Y is again a chain complex. So this is what Y is representing, right? So I have a map that goes from X to Y. So whenever I write something like this, okay, so as I said before, okay, uh, 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 you know, as mathematicians, we would like to write it in as compact a way as possible, right? So uh, when we write like this, we actually mean that for every N, there is a function phi n. OK, so when we write something like this, uh, 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 you know, we will say that for every n. 
there is a function phi n which goes from x n to y n, right? And uh, 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 this itself is a vector space homomorphism. So x n is a vector space, y n is a vector space, and this phi n which goes from x n to y n is a vector space homomorphism, right? So uh, we will say such a sequence of maps is a chain map if this diagram commutes okay so by that i mean if you proceed in this direction or you proceed in this direction you will end up with the same output right so that's what is written over here so sort of you uh, first apply fn then you apply phi n minus one so you start from here and end up here or alternatively you first apply phi n and then you apply gn okay you will end up with the same output okay so that's what uh, it means okay so i hope everyone is comfortable with this idea of a chain map if you have any questions, please ask them now. If uh, uh, you know you have any questions regarding a chain map, please let me know. All right, so I don't see any raised hand, so let's advance. So then we discuss some consequences of a chain map, right? So the consequences are the, uh, 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 you know, the important properties of having a chain map was the following. OK, so the first was if you have an element in the kernel of Fn, right? So let's try to understand, uh, uh, you know, where does this X lie? So you have Xn and Fn is a map from Xn to Xn minus one. So Fn lies over here. So kernel of Fn, <coughs> this is all elements in Xn such that Fn uh, of X is zero. Right, so this is what is the kernel of Fn. So let's consider an element in the kernel of Fn. Right, we then showed that whenever we have a chain map, x belonging to kernel of Fn means that phi n of x must lie in kernel of Gn. Right, so x lies over here, phi n of x lies in Yn. <clears throat> so what we are saying is that if x lies in the kernel of Fn, phi n of x must lie in the kernel of Gn. In the same way, although I did not prove it, I stated this and, uh, uh, you know, sort of left it as an exercise for you all to go back home and, uh, you know, figure out, uh, uh, you know, how the proof goes. But the statement was that if X lies in image of Fn plus one, then it automatically implies that the image of X under phi n, which is phi n of X, this must lie in the image of Gn plus one. So again, let us try and understand where X is. So X is an element in X. And we are saying that X lies in the image of Fn plus one, which means that there is an element in Xn plus one, okay, uh, 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 which under Fn plus one gets mapped to X. That's what this statement over here means. And we are saying that whenever such a thing happens, the image of X under phi n, which is phi n of X, must also be in the image of Gn plus one, okay? So uh, uh, this is what uh, were the two things that we discussed uh, concerning this. Um, uh, you know, chain map, right? Uh, so now uh, uh, at the end of last class, I sort of spoke about this induced uh, map. OK, so I didn't maybe do a good job last time. So let me sort of go over this a bit carefully, right? So what we are given is this, uh, 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 these two chain complexes, one on the top, one on the bottom, right? So I hope you agree that whenever we have a chain complex, right, we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, define this uh, hn of x right so hn of x is basically you take the kernel of fn uh, and quotient it with the image of fn plus one so you can do this for every n similarly you can define this hn of y which is the nth homology group uh, 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 associated with y so you can define this as kernel of gn quotient it with image of gn plus one and you can do this for every n i hope you agree right so now what I'm saying is that whenever you have such a setup, right? That is, you have a chain complex at the top, a chain complex at the bottom, and a chain map between these two chain complexes, then there is an induced map, which we denote as phi star. And notice what I have written. This phi star goes from h of x to h of y, right? So again, one thing that must arise in your mind is, oh, what is now h of x? We only know hn of x and we only know hn of y. So what is this uh, h of x and h of y? Well, the idea again is the following that h of x now denotes this sequence over here and h of y denotes this sequence over here. 
right? And this phi, uh, phi star represents a sequence of functions phi n plus 1 star, phi n star, phi n minus 1 star. So, there is a phi uh, 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 k star for every k. And this phi n star goes from h n of x to h n of y. And the claim is that this diagram, okay, also commutes, right? This is what uh, uh, is the claim, right? So, let me now again summarize what is the story. So, the story is as follows. You started with a, a chain map. So, what we are saying is that whenever you have a chain map, this induces or this in a natural way leads to the definition of another function which we denote it as uh, phi star. So when we say phi star, uh, 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 implicitly we mean that we have a sequence of these functions where the nth element in this sequence goes from h n of x to h n of y, right? So I've still not defined what is this phi n star, but uh, the claim is that there is such a function and this diagram commutes, right? And Okay, so uh, there is a claim that such a diagram commutes and now I'm going to define what these different functions are. Okay, so just one minute. Uh, Just one minute, huh? there is some issue that I'm facing. Okay, so I apologize for <clears throat> the issue. There is some bug in the app and I'm unable to resolve it. 
Okay, so anyways. Okay, so the conclusion is that uh, uh, this diagram over here commutes, right? So now let me define what these different functions are. Okay, so I'm now going to spend some time defining these different functions. Okay, so what are these different functions? Okay, so let's first uh, recall what the diagram is. So you have this, uh, 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 you know, hn plus 1 of x, you have hn of x, and you have this hn minus 1 of x, you have this fn uh, plus 1, you have fn, then you have hn plus 1 of y, you have hn of y, <coughs> you have hn minus 1 of y, so this is gn plus 1 gn, and here you have the phi n plus 1 star operator, here you have phi n star operator and here you have phi n minus star and this sort of continues on either directions. Right? So let us now see what how to define these different functions. So the first thing you have to notice that hn of x actually includes equivalence classes. So recall how we define hn of x. So hn of x is you take the kernel of fn and quotient it with image of fn plus 1. Right? So this is how you define hn of x. Similarly, you define hn of y to be kernel of gn quotiented with image of gn plus 1. Right? So this is how you define hn of x and hn of y. Now, <clears throat> let us see how to define these fn functions. So first of all, notice that these functions were already there between, uh, 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 you know, your uh, uh, xn. Uh, so recall fn was a function which went from Earlier, it went from xn plus 1 to xn. So what we are saying is that the same function can also be viewed as a function that goes from hn of uh, hn plus 1 of x to hn of x. So let's see how it goes, right? So we uh, 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 so what we are saying is that you take some equivalence class in this hn of x. Okay, so let's say that equivalence class is x. And now how to apply this fn of this equivalence class of x. So my claim is that the way you have to define this is you first apply fn of x and take its equivalence class, right? So this equivalence class is in hn of x. This equivalence class is in hn minus 1 of x, right? So uh, 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 let us, you know, first complete the definitions and then we will make sure these definitions make sense. Similarly, how is this gn function defined? <clears throat> so gn earlier went from yn to yn minus 1, right? So now what we are saying is that gn can also be thought of as going from hn of y to hn minus 1 of y. And how is it defined? You take gn, <coughs> take an equivalence class in this uh, 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 in this vector space, right? Or this, is, uh, this equivalence class is an element of hn of y. So what you do is you first apply gn on y and then take its equivalence class. So this equivalence class is over here. And the final thing that I have to define is how is this phi n star of this equivalence class defined? Well, that is also defined <coughs> in similar spirit. So you first take an equivalence class in hn of x, right? And then what you do is you apply phi n on x. This can be done because recall phi n is a map from xn to yn, right? And then what we are saying is whatever is the output, you take its equivalence class. Is this okay? So uh, this is how these functions are defined. Okay, and now, uh, 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 you know, over the next couple of minutes, we will sort of uh, focus on why, is, why do these definitions actually make sense. Okay, so that is what we are going to do now. Okay, so let's now try to go over it step by step. Uh, uh, first, let's try to understand what is the issue with such a definition, right? So before uh, 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 discussing that, let's try to recall what this x is, right? x is a set. Whenever I write square bracket x, it means the equivalence class of x. In particular, it's the set of all those elements x prime in kernel of fn such that x prime is equivalent to x. Right. And how is this equivalence notion defined? Well, it is defined in the following way that x prime minus x must belong to image of fn plus 1. Is this okay? So the first thing that uh, you have to notice is that x, the square bracket x is a set. 
and I'm defining a function on the set, right? Okay, I mean, I can define functions of sets. That is not an issue. However, what worry, what should worry you is that notice the definition is in some sense dependent on the representative that you choose for this set, right? So I hope you agree that if X prime, sorry, if X prime was an element in X, then X, uh, the uh, uh, equivalence class of X prime will also be X. In which case, if I apply Fn to this square bracket X, and if I apply Fn to the square bracket X prime, I hope you agree that the output should be one and the same, right? This is what would make this definition well defined. Do you agree? So uh, whenever a function is defined over such a set, we have to make sure that if the definition depends on the representative, okay, uh, 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 you know, like in this, uh, the way it is defined over here, the definition in some sense appears to depend on the representative. We have to show that if we change the representative, the output that we would obtain will continue to be the same. Okay, so that is what we need to verify. Okay, and that is what we are going to verify now. Okay, so let us now try to verify. So as I said, uh, uh, we have to verify that let x and x prime okay let x and x prime be two elements which are equivalent okay so which means that uh, 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 you know x prime uh, uh, minus x lies in image of fn plus 1 and furthermore x and x prime okay these are in uh, uh, kernel of fn right so why am i taking elements in kernel of fn because recall what is hn of x with this is kernel of Fn quotient it with image of Fn plus 1, right? So what does this mean? This means all x such that x lies, uh, all equivalence classes of x such that x lies in kernel of Fn, right? So what I'm saying is that uh, uh, indeed uh, this uh, vector space over here, the elements of this are equivalence classes. Now what we are saying is that if two equivalence classes are the same, right? Uh, 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 same in the sense of uh, 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 this condition over here, then we want to say that if you apply Fn, right, the output that you would obtain will be one and the same, right? So this is what is stated over here. We wish to show that if X and X prime are two elements in Zn of X, I should actually say this is um, kernel of Fn. I think I have not defined Zn of X. So if they belong to kernel of Fn, right, uh, 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 and if uh, their equivalence classes are one and the same, then if you apply Fn, their outputs will be one and the same. Okay, so let me pause over here. Uh, if you have any questions with regards to what we are trying to show, this may be a good time to ask. Please let me know. Is this clear why we are trying to show this? Please raise your hand if you have any doubts. All right, surprisingly, no one seems to have any questions. So I presume everybody has understood what, why we are trying to show this. Okay, so now let's uh, spend some time to show that indeed, if uh, the equivalence class of X and the equivalence class of X prime is one and the same, right? Then their outputs are also the same, right? So let's try to show this. Since <coughs> equivalence class of X and equivalence class of X prime are one and the same, this means that X and X prime are equivalent which uh, 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 in turn means that the difference between X prime and X lies in, uh, so I shouldn't say boundary because I have not defined it. So maybe I'll call it as image of Fn plus one, right? So this is the condition. So this means that there, so if this difference lies in image of Fn plus one, this means that I can uh, find a B in image of Fn plus one, such that x prime must equal x plus b. Okay, so this condition must be true if uh, 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 x and x prime are equivalent, right? Now, uh, uh, my claim is that in this case, fn of x prime must equal fn of x plus fn of b. And furthermore, this fn of b must be zero and consequently fn of x prime must equal fn of x. Okay, can one of you please volunteer and tell me why is this step true and why is this step true? Can one of you please volunteer? 
yes deep go ahead yeah fn yeah, is a homomorphism and uh, so this we is know that property okay linearity property yeah and second yes. is uh, fn composed with fn plus 1 will identically be zero so that's why okay so this follows from the fact that this is identically zero and that's why we obtain this so i hope you agree that if x and x prime are equivalent then fn of x prime must equal fn of x right so this is trivially true right and now what uh, we can now see is that if x and x prime are equivalent right which means that their equivalence classes are equivalent now if i apply fn on both sides right so maybe uh, i'll put a question mark over here to indicate that this is something we would like to verify so as per the definition of fn this should be the equivalence class of fn of x right however we have just showed that fn of x is fn of x prime so the equivalence class of fn of x must equal the equivalence class of x, uh, uh, fn of x prime but the equivalence class of fn of x prime is precisely this as per the definition of fn right and from this it follows that indeed this relationship is true is this okay uh, so let me pause over here uh, if there are any questions on you know how we uh, uh, indeed manage to show that this relationship holds this may be a good time to ask please let me know if you have any questions uh, yes uh, amritandu please go ahead sir uh, shouldn't the map fn just be zero fn of what should be zero like uh, the way we are defining the fn over uh, these equivalence classes uh, right so your claim is that it should be zero is that your claim Yes, yes, because uh, f n of x belongs to uh, b n minus one x, uh, b n minus one basically. So let's just try to go over it step by step. So I hope you first agree that this x over here belongs to uh, h n of x. Is this okay? Yes. So far so good. Now what you are claiming is that f n. So first, the first question is, you know, how does one define this function over here? right this is something that we are defining now and i am claiming that a natural way to define it is the following that this equals the equivalence class of fn of x so far so good yes now is your claim that fn of x is always zero is that your claim no fn of x not the not the term inside not the bracket like not the equivalence class mm -hmm. just just fn of x belongs mm -hmm. to bn minus 1 fn of x belongs to bn minus 1 is that your claim this is uh, this is just uh, true right this is true right so fn right. of x trivially belongs to image of fn if this is your question then indeed yes. this is true yes now if we take the equivalence class like if we put a bracket around fn my fn x then that mm -hmm. is just equal to uh, taking the quotient by bn minus 1 this is equal to taking the quotient so you are saying that this belongs to zero over uh, 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 you know over hn minus 1 this belongs to zero in uh, hn minus 1 is that your question yes yes so that is true okay uh, but i am saying that even if it is not equal to zero right this will be true is that okay uh, you are right hmm? no so i am thinking that, that uh, in both these cases this will be zero no i'm thinking that the the commutative diagram that you showed sir between uh, the various uh, uh, homology groups uh, yes. then that will become trivially true because fn's and the gn's are both equal to zero so then uh, it, it, so anyway the part we have still not come uh, like we have not reached that part okay at this point okay. i'm just discussing this part of, at the top right how to define this fn is this okay right oh. so how we define this fn is it takes this equivalence class to uh, uh, this equivalence class over here and you are saying that this is zero and i agree with you okay oh, okay okay so let okay. me just nevertheless think a bit about it i hope i am not missing something so you have a fn function over here and it will map everything to zero over here so it is correct at least as far as i understand there is no issue with this the way we have defined it is this okay yes 
Okay, so we uh, you are right that the commutative uh, commutativity part will be trivially true. You are right. Is that okay? But we will discuss that. Okay, and in okay. the same way we have something at the bottom, right? So we have something at the bottom, and in the same way my claim is that this G N of uh, 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 you know y this we can trivially define to be this equivalence class of this, and as Amritandu pointed out, yes, this will also be zero. So this part concerns what happens at the top. This part concerns what happens at the bottom, right? Now uh, uh, the non-trivial part is how is this p n star function defined? Okay, and that's what we are going to discuss now. Okay, so this uh, uh, you know as you will notice, okay, this is not as straightforward uh, uh, you know as uh, uh, you know the verification was in the context of f n and g n, right? But uh, uh, more than the verification part, I hope you all are able to appreciate, okay, why we need to do this uh, uh, check. Okay, so when I uh, say why we need to do this check, uh, 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 what do I mean is that you are defining this function on a set, right? And the way we define this uh, function, right? So the way we define this function, just one minute, my app is giving me some issues. So now it's a fine. Let me share my screen again. All right. <clears throat> okay. So as I said, uh, the FN and the GN part uh, is not that difficult to see why this uh, function is well defined. However, I hope you are all able to appreciate why we need to verify or make sure that these definitions are well defined. Okay, so as I said, we are defining this uh, function on a set and uh, you know, a priori or uh, you know, by the uh, uh, you know, first look at it, it may appear that this definition actually depends on the representative that we are choosing for our equivalence class, right? So that is what we have to make sure that this, uh, 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 you know, definition indeed does not depend on the uh, representative that we choose for this equivalence class. Okay, so that is why we need to make sure that uh, uh, you know this definition is correct all right okay so now the last thing that we have to verify is this the way we define this pn star of x right so what did we do was pn star of this equivalence class x we said this equals you take pn of x and think of the equivalence class concerning pn of x right so again the way we have defined this it may appear that you know we are somehow uh, uh, you know focusing on the representative that is there in the equivalence class right so at first glance it may appear that this definition depends on the representative that we choose for this equivalence class and now what we have to show is that uh, uh, this uh, uh, the way we have defined this okay it actually doesn't depend on what representative that we choose for the equivalence class right so in the same way as we did before okay we have to ask if let's say x and x prime Okay, are uh, 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 two elements in the kernel of F n uh, uh, such that their equivalence classes are one and the same, right? So then, uh, 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 these two functions, okay, should give the same output. Okay, so I hope this is clear. Why we need to verify this, right? So let's uh, 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 now try to prove this part, right? So again, okay, as we discussed before, since the equivalence class of x and x prime is one and the same, it follows that x prime must be of the form x plus b where b must lie in the image of fn plus 1 right so this is what must happen right now <coughs> in the previous case we somehow managed to show that 
uh, when I say previous case, I mean in the context of Fn and Gn, we somehow managed to show that Fn of x and Fn of x prime must be one and the same, right? However, this need not be the case in the case uh, 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 when we deal with phi n. So it is it need not be the case that phi n of x prime must equal phi n of x. Okay, so these things could be different as well, right? So nevertheless, what we are saying is that these two definitions. Uh, uh, even if phi n of x and phi n of x prime are not the same, right? This, uh, 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 equi uh, 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 you know, this equivalence should hold. Is this okay? So let's try to see uh, uh, why this equivalence should hold. Okay, so what we know so far is that x prime and x are related by this relation. Furthermore, we know that x lies in uh, the kernel of f n. So why does it lie in the kernel of f n? Because uh, you know, uh, 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 this phi n star. And phi n, I mean, phi n star is defined on the equivalence class of x, and this equivalence class, okay, this lies in H n of x, right? And H n of x is all equivalence classes such that x belongs to kernel of f n, okay? So that's the reason your uh, uh, x over here belongs to kernel of f n, and uh, we know that b over here lies in image of f n plus one, right? Now we also know that this uh, 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 diagram. Okay, between these xn's and yn's, okay, and this uh, chain map that we have that commutes, right? And because of that, there are some consequences. In particular, these two facts, okay, tell us that since x belongs to kernel of fn, phi n of x must lie in kernel of gn. Similarly, if b lies in image of fn plus one. This implies that phi n of b must lie in image of gn plus one. Is this okay? So let me pause over here. If you have any questions on this part, let me know. Let me know if you have any questions on this. This just follows from the fact that X lies in kernel of Fn and B lies in image of Fn plus one, right? So as soon as I, you know, uh, uh, state these two conditions, it immediately follows that phi n of X must be equivalent to phi n of X prime. Right, so now uh, you know. First, you have to understand, uh, you know, what is this equivalence that I am now talking about. So the first thing you have to notice is that there is x n here, right, and x n x prime belong to x n, right, and then there is y n at the bottom. There is phi n here. So phi n of x and phi n of x prime lie over here. Is this okay? So when I say phi n of x and phi n of x prime, okay, are equivalent. I mean it in the context of this H n of y, right? So I uh, uh, mean this equivalence is with regards to the quotient that we take with respect to image of g n plus one, right? So accordingly, in order to check whether phi n of x is equivalent to phi n of x prime, it suffices to check if phi n of x prime minus phi n of x, okay, this lies in image of g n plus one, right? However, this is again trivially true. Because phi n of x prime minus phi n of x, okay, by the linearity property of phi n, this is just phi n of x prime minus x, and phi n of x prime minus x is precisely phi n of b, and we have already stated here that phi n of b must lie in the image of g n plus one. Is this okay? So from this, it follows that, uh, 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 you know, these two things follow that uh, phi n of sorry. Phi n of x and phi n of x prime lie in kernel of G n. Furthermore, phi n of x must be equivalent to phi n of x prime. So from this, it follows that the equivalence class of phi n of x must equal the equivalence class of phi n of x prime, and this immediately tells us that these two things must be one and the same. Why should these two things be one and the same? Because the way we had defined this phi n star of the equivalence class of x was this is the way we had defined it, and similarly we had defined this to be uh, phi n of x prime, the equivalence class of this. Okay, so let me pause over here. Uh, if there are any questions on how we went about uh, verifying whether this definition of uh, phi n star, okay, which is the induced map. Uh, uh, you know, verifying whether this was an uh, well-defined map. Okay, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Do you have any questions?
So such questions will be part of your assignment and your exam. So if you have any clarifications, please feel free to ask them now. All right, so I don't see any raised hand, so maybe we can advance. OK, so. <clears throat> OK, so now. Um, you know, so now we have managed to show that indeed uh, phi n of x, the equivalence class of phi n of x and the equivalence class of phi n of x prime are one and the same, right? Again, these equivalence classes are in Hn of y. Is this OK? So these equivalence classes are in Hn of y, right? And uh, 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 so this implies that phi n star of this equals phi n star of this. So this in particular implies that uh, uh, the representative that you choose for your equivalence class doesn't matter. OK, when we are dealing with this phi n star operators. OK, so now the last thing that remains to show is that uh, 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 this diagram actually commutes. OK, so uh, 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 OK, so I will sort of leave this as an exercise. OK, you just have to verify whether uh, you know if you first uh, you know, go in this direction. That is, you first apply Fn plus one, and then you apply phi n star. Or if you go in this direction, that is, you first apply phi n plus one star, and then apply g n plus one. You end up with the same answer. Okay, and Amritandu actually uh, sort of gave an easier proof than what I had in mind. Okay, so the easier proof is that uh, uh, you know this Fn plus one maps everything over here to zero, right? So this is the equivalence class of zero, and phi n star will map. Uh, to the equivalence class uh, to the additive identity of Hn of y. And similarly, uh, 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 you know, you take anything over here, let's say the equivalence class of x. So you would have something over here, right? Phi n star of this, whatever this element is, gn plus 1 will actually take it to 0 again, right? So in this simple way, you can check that this diagram actually commutes in a, a trivial fashion, right? So anyway, so what is the conclusion of this, uh, uh, you know, this big discussion that we had. So the big discussion was, let's say you have a chain complex at the top. And let's say you had Fn plus one, Fn, Fn minus one over here. And similarly, let's say you had a chain complex at the bottom, right? So I should say it sort of extends in either direction. So this is Yn minus one, this is Gn minus one, this is Gn, this is Gn plus one. And let's say you have these functions over here, right? And uh, let's say this is a chain map, right? So chain map means that this each of these must be a vector space homomorphism. Furthermore, this diagram should commute, right? So these two properties, if you have in such a situation, you have that uh, there is another diagram that commutes, which is Hn plus one of X. There is Hn of X. There is Hn minus one of X and between them you have this Fn plus one Fn again, right? And here you have this phi n star which goes from Hn of X to Hn of Y. Here you have Hn plus one of Y and here you have phi n plus one star and uh, here you have this Hn minus one of Y and here you have phi n minus one star and here you have Gn, Gn plus one and this diagram also extends in either direction and this diagram also commutes. OK, so this diagram. Also commutes. OK, so that is the conclusion and the more important part is that uh, uh, you know how this phi n star is defined, right? So so you can see that we are sort of uh, uh, in some sense going towards this mayer vitoris theorem, right? And some say sense if you can think of this X as some simplicial complex, Y as some simplicial complex. Right, and uh, 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 you know, if you had this uh, uh, chain complex above and the chain complex below, which was defined using these boundary operators, then in some sense, this uh, if x and y are related in some sense via this phi n function, right? Then this phi n star tells us the relation between these different homology spaces, right? So in this sense, you can see that we are slowly advancing towards this mayer vitoris uh, uh, theorem. Is that okay? All right. OK, so now uh, uh, you know we are uh, ready to. So now we are ready to state the mayer vitoris theorem. First I will state it, allow you all to ponder over it. OK, and then we will discuss what does this theorem mean. OK, so uh, let us try and understand. So the mayer vitoris theorem goes as follows. Let M be some simplicial complex. OK, so this is some simplicial complex that has been given to you. And let us say K1 and K2 
are sub complexes of m which means that k1 and k2 right these are themselves simplicial complexes okay so this is the first thing that these are themselves simplicial complexes furthermore k1 is a subset of m and k2 is a subset of m is this okay so these two conditions hold that these are both of these are simplicial complexes furthermore uh, individually these uh, k1 and k2 are subsets of m right and they have the uh, uh, property that if you take the union of k1 and k2 you get m right and i am not saying that this is like a pairwise disjoint union which uh, means that you know uh, k1 intersection k2 is empty so this condition is not being assumed over here is this okay all we are saying is that if uh, k1 and k2 are two sub complexes it is possible that k1 and k2 have uh, common faces that's fine right however if k1 and k2 are themselves simplicial complexes such that their union is m right and let uh, separately l denote the intersection of k1 and k2 then the mayer vitoris theorem states that this sequence that you have okay uh, is exact okay so that is what the mayer vitoris theorem says first let's try to understand uh, you know the different elements of this sequence and then we will sort of uh, uh, you know try to appreciate and understand what this theorem says right so first thing you have to notice is that this arrow sort of extends in uh, like you know infinitely uh, in the i mean it keeps extending forever right so that's what it means and i'm going to sort of tell you a part of this sequence right that's what i'm going to do so the first element in this portion is hn of l so recall what l is l is the intersection of k1 and k2 right so hn of l is basically the so uh, 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 can one of you tell me if k1 and k2 are simplicial complexes is k1 intersection k2 also a simplicial complex can one of you volunteer and tell me that the question is if k1 and k2 are simplicial complexes is the intersection of k1 and k2 a simplicial complex yes pankaj please go ahead <coughs> uh, if they don't share any component i think they won't be a simplicial complex yes why not the empty set so, we will really yeah. consider it to be a simplicial complex okay okay what about if they share a face what about then uh, so can you help me recall what is the definition of a simplicial complex when do we say a collection of subsets is a simplicial complex if they are closed under subset operation very good so the given the information that is given to you is that k1 and k2 are simplicial complexes right and the question is is k1 intersection k2 a simplicial complex what do you think the empty set you know uh, it's sort of tricky uh, uh, you know whether it's a simplicial complex or not and what i'm saying is that we will by definition assume it to be a trivial simplicial complex okay so let's consider that to be a simplicial complex now what can you say about the intersection in general uh, maybe someone else wants to try pankaj maybe you can think about it hmm? yeah sure yes jacob would you like to try Um, suppose there is a face having p vertices. Um, okay. B1, Let's B2. say sigma is in uh, k1 intersection k2, and what you are saying is that it has p vertices. So let's say uh, v1 to vp. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And since this face belongs to both k1 and k2, then its subsets must also be part of k1 and k2. Very good. Okay. So that's the argument. So I hope it's clear that if a face belongs to the intersection. right all the subsets of this space must also belong to the intersection okay and in that sense it's easy to see that k1 and k uh, k1 intersection k2 indeed uh, 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 must be a uh, what should i say must be a simplicial complex right so why did i uh, 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 you know ask you to verify whether this k1 intersection k2 is a simplicial complex because one can now talk about the homology groups associated with this simplicial complex right so uh, what this theorem says is that this following sequence Uh, you know with sort of extends forever in either directions right this infinite sequence is exact and a portion of this sequence starts as uh, uh, goes as follows you start with hn of l okay there is some map which i'll talk about okay and this goes to uh, the direct sum of these two vector spaces right so hn of k1 
This is the nth homology group of K1. This is HN of K2, which is the nth homology group of K2. And you're looking at the direct sum of these vector spaces, right? So, so far, so no problem. You can talk about the direct sums. Then uh, uh, the third element here is the nth homology group of M. So M recall is the union of K1 and K2, right? So uh, the claim is that if you sort of go in this direction, right? Uh, uh, you sort of uh, 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 the second element is this direct sum. The third uh, uh, element in the sequence is HN of M. So notice that I have not specified what this uh, vector space homomorphism over here is. OK, so uh, this is uh, because this uh, definition is uh, uh, slightly complicated and that will sort of take us, uh, uh, you know, into a lot of algebra. I don't want to do that. So instead, what I'll say is that there is some vector space homomorphism. Right. And similarly, there is some vector space homomorphism over here. So you have HN of M and here you have HN minus one of L. And then you see that this and this are in some sense similar, just that the dimension has reduced by one. Right. And now you go uh, in the same way as what happened before. Here you had mu n, here you had mu n minus one. Right. And, uh, 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 you know, you look at the direct sum of HN minus one of K1 and HN minus one of K2. And what we are claiming is that this infinite sequence of, uh, 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 you know, vector spaces and these vector space homomorphisms. So of course, I have not told you what the vector space homomorphisms are over here. But uh, I will, uh, uh, you know, emphasize that there are some vector space homomorphisms here as well, and there is some way to define it. But what is more important is that along with these uh, uh, vector space homomorphisms and these vector spaces, everything put together forms an exact sequence. Is this okay? So let me, uh, 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 you know, pause over here. Uh, uh, you know, after our discussion, I'll tell you what these new ends are. So uh, do you have any questions on what does this part mean? I'll allow you to stare at it for some time. If you have any questions, please ask. Yes, Rankit, please go ahead. Uh, sir, what do you mean by saying the following sequence is exact? OK, so first of all, do you agree it's a sequence? So, I mean, I have written it in some complicated yeah. manner, but at the end of the day, I hope you agree that, you know, you can start with HN of L, right? You can go to HN K1, direct sum HN K2, Right, and then you can sort of go to HN of M, then you can go to HN of HN minus one of L, then you can go to HN minus one K1, direct sum HN minus one of K2, and you can keep doing this. Is this okay? So first of all, do you agree that there is a sequence, Rankit? Yes, sir. And what I'm claiming is that there are some vector space homomorphisms between these vector spaces. So I hope you agree that each of this is a vector space. This is a vector space because, uh, you know, we are taking a quotient of a vector space with itself. This is a direct sum of vector spaces. So that also is a vector space. This is a vector space. This is a vector space. This is a direct sum of vector spaces. So everything over here is a vector space. And furthermore, I'm claiming that there are some suitably defined vector space homomorphisms. So I'm not giving all of you, but I'm uh, uh, all of them, but I'm giving uh, uh, some of them uh, in particular, the one that goes from uh, between HN of L to this and the one that goes between uh, uh, HN minus one of L to this direct sum. So there are some vector space homomorphisms and I'm claiming that this sequence is exact. Now, what does that mean? OK, so exact always means that whenever you have a sequence. So let's go back to this simpler representation. So let's say you had blah, 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 a n plus one, a n, uh, a n minus one, blah, blah, blah. So let's say you had such a sequence which continues forever. And let's say you had some map over here. Let's say this was some eta n plus one and this was some eta n. So we will say this entire sequence is exact if for every n, the kernel of eta n equals the image of eta n plus one. OK, so whenever this condition holds for all n, we will say that this whole sequence is exact. And in the same way, I'm saying that there is some complicated sequence over here. Right. Nevertheless, it's a sequence of vector spaces and vector space homomorphisms in between. And I'm claiming that this big thing over here is exact. That's what I'm claiming. Does that answer your question, Rankit? Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, yes, Deep, do you, did you have a question? Yeah, two questions. I think the first one is just a simple clarification. So this group is repeated for different values of n. That's what you're saying when the sequence extends to both sides. That's what you mean, right? 
Yes, so, so HN, you see that, yeah. uh, I mean, I sort of gave you a portion. So you can see there is HN of L. You see there is HN minus one of L, right? And then you get this direct sum, which is in some sense having a dimension less than this. Do you agree? Instead of yeah. HN, you have yeah. HN minus one. Now, if I hmm. ask you what will come next, can you guess what will come next? Yeah, HN minus one M, then it'll go to HN minus two L and so on. So on, precisely. That's how this uh, sequence continues on either directions. Is that okay? Yeah, another question is so I didn't get what exactly are we trying to do here. So you have this intersection from there. We are going to the, the individual parts from there. Yeah. We are going so to the right actual... to appreciate that. OK, so I hope you appreciate that. You know, I couldn't have stated this mayor Vitoris theorem before. There are a lot of technical terms, right? So let's uh, uh, as we passed, what are we trying to do over here? Right? So if you remember when I sort of motivated mayor Vitoris theorem, I said that in some sense, Let's say there is this uh, 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 simplicial complex M and in some sense it is uh, sorry, not in some sense. It is related to some simpler simplicial complexes. So K1 and K2, if you think of them as simpler simplicial complexes, right? What this diagram tells us is it sort of relates the homology groups of this complicated simplicial complex to the simpler simplicial complexes. That Does that answer your question deep? So I am trying to break it into K1, K2 and intersection of that. So some somewhat simpler part. That's what is going on. Uh, so K1 and K2 are simplicial complexes themselves. And I'm saying that this is the relation between the homology groups of M, L, K1, K2. Is this OK? Yeah, OK. Right now, indeed, uh, uh, you know, at first glance, it may appear to be very, very complicated. You may be like, oh, what is this complicated relation? Well, in some sense, it is complicated. However, it's more of a case of you getting used to what is happening over here. Once you get used to it, you will sort of realize that, oh, this is not really that complicated. And, you know, you have to make yourself familiar with this uh, uh, theorem over here because uh, we will be talking about uh, the implications of this theorem in this class and the next class. So you don't have to know the proof of this theorem. We won't be talking about the proof of this theorem in this class. Nevertheless, you should be able to understand what is this theorem trying to say. OK, and in order to finish the statement of the theorem, what now remains to explain is what these mu n and mu n minus one maps are. OK, so now let me explain what these maps are. So my claim is that. Uh, 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 so L OK is a simplicial complex. I hope you uh, uh, agree. So recall what L is. L is K1 intersection K2, right? So L is a simplicial complex and K1 is a simplicial complex. And I can talk about an inclusion map that goes from L to K1, right? So let's understand what is happening over here, right? So L is a subset of K1. Right, and uh, this symbol over here, right? This symbol over here means that, okay, so this, uh, you know, uh, sort of this curved arrow, this sort of indicates that we are talking about an inclusion function, right? So, what does an inclusion function mean? It means the following notice that L is a subset of K1, right? So, what I'll do is uh, 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 I will take one element in L, right? So let's say sigma is a subset. Uh, sigma is an element in L. Now, since L is a subset of K1, I hope you agree that sigma will also belong to K1. So I of sigma is precisely sigma. OK, so now uh, uh, if you have any questions on the definition of I, please let me know. I'd be happy to explain. Does anyone have any question on how I define this I function? Yes, Jacob, please go ahead. Can you repeat this statement like function? So I is a function that goes from L to K1. OK, now L is a okay. collection of sets. Do you agree? Um, yes, because it's a simplicial complex. It's a collection of sets right now. L is K1 intersection K2. So do you agree that L is a subset of K1? Do you agree with this? Um, yes, which means that every set in L is also there in K1. Yes. So all I'm saying is that, uh, uh, you know, you take any such sigma in uh, uh, L, right? My claim is that this sigma automatically lies in K1. Do you agree? Um, yes. And I'm just mapping that sigma to this sigma. 
so it's so just the identity map it's not the identity i mean in some sense it's an identity but uh, you have to notice that l is a subset of k1 so okay, every not. face in k1 will not be there in l that's the point okay, i'm okay. stressing okay. is this okay hmm? okay so far so good does anyone have any questions on i and in the same way j is defined now l is also a subset of k2 so j can be defined in the same way it takes a, 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 a element of l to the same element in k2 is this okay so this is the way i define this i and j now my claim is that i and j are actually uh, one can think of them as the uh, 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 chain maps okay so now let me sort of uh, tell uh, prescribe to you what do i mean by these chain maps okay so so for a chain map you need two chain complexes uh, uh, so let me sort of tell you what these chain complexes are so i is a map that goes from l to k1 so what i'll do is i'll first write these things over here hn plus 1 of l hn of uh, l just one minute i want to make sure i'm doing the right thing So this, uh, I want to see what is the thing over here. Is it HN of L? Uh, oh, okay. Okay. So this is correct. Um, so this is HN plus one of L. There is HN minus one of L and so on. And at the bottom you have HN plus one of K1, HN of K1, and then you have HN minus one of K1. Okay. And then what I'm claiming is that, okay, just a minute. Huh? Uh, sorry, sorry. I think this is not the way. Uh, I just realized that I was making some mistake. So what you need to do is you need to first define this CN plus one of L, CN of L and uh, uh, CN minus one of L. So this, called, this sort of goes in either directions and you have these boundary operators over here. Similarly, you have the CN plus one of K1, uh, CN of K1 and CN minus one of K1 and you have these boundary operators here as well, right? And now I hope you agree that you can talk about this I function over here, right? So, uh, 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 so let me sort of, uh, uh, you know, specify what do I mean by this? So you have I, IN, IN plus one and IN minus one. So my first claim is that this fun, uh, this uh, uh, diagram over here commutes. OK, so now first let's try to see, uh, uh, you know, what is there on the top. So what is there on the top is clear. You have a simplicial complex L. So we can talk about the different, uh, I mean, chains of different order that are associated with L. So you have CN plus one of L, you have CN of L, you have CN minus one of L and so on. And you can define these boundary operators. Similarly, since K1 is a simplicial complex, we can define these P chain spaces uh, of different dimensions and we can define this boundary operator. Now I'm claiming that you this I over here actually implies a chain map, which means that you can have a sequence of these maps. And uh, what does this map do? Right. So this map takes some chain. OK, in CN of L and maps it to C. OK. Uh, so can uh, uh, one of you, you know, justify why this definition makes sense? Can one of you please justify why this definition makes sense? Can one of you please justify why this definition makes sense? Please volunteer. Yes, Pankaj, please go ahead. I think you already said, uh, I mean, uh, because L is a subset of K1, K1. and yeah, and all CN the faces. L must be a subset of CN of K1. Yeah. Do you agree? Because CN of L is all formal sums of N faces in L. Do you agree? Like yeah. what is C1 of L? C1 of L is sum of AI, EI. Right, uh, I equals uh, uh, one to F one, right, and F one of L. Do you agree with this? Yes. 
this is all such linear combinations. A i belongs to Z two. Do you agree? And now what I'm claiming is that since L is a subset of K one, if you look at C one of K one, which is again all A i E i, the only difference being now we have to look at all those edges in K one, right? And since Every edge that is there in L is also an edge in K1. I hope you agree that C1 of L will be a subset of C1 of K1. Do you agree, Pankaj? Yes, sir. So all I'm saying is that you take the chain, that chain, whatever chain you take in C1 of L, that will also be there in Cn of K1. Just map it to that chain. Is this okay? Does anyone have any questions with this diagram? Please let me know. Okay, and now I'm claiming that this diagram actually commutes. So this diagram commutes means if you go in this direction or if you go in this direction, you will get the same answer. So since this diagram commutes, this I that you have over here can be thought of as a chain map and this chain map has an induced map, right? So this, indu this induces a map and that induced map we will sort of represent by I n star. Is this okay? Similarly, uh, 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 you know, you have this uh, uh, J function which goes from L to K2. This can also be thought as a chain map, right? So since this is a chain map, this also induces another function J n star, right? Uh, uh, so that is what this J n star over here is. So where does this I n star and J n star, uh, you know, map uh, like what is the domain and co-domain of this I n star and J n star? So let's come back to this diagram, right? So uh, uh, from this diagram, it should be clear that your I n star will go from H n of L to H n of K1. Similarly, your J n star will actually go from H n of L to H n of K2. Is this okay? So now let's come back to this diagram and let's try to see what is this uh, uh, map nu n that we have over here. OK, so what is this map uh, uh, nu n that we have over here? Right, so let's try to understand. So nu n OK actually goes from H n of L. So this is nu n and this goes from H n of L to H n of K1 direct sum H n of K2. Right, so let's try to see how is this u n defined, right? So you give me an element in H n of L. So let's say that element is this equivalence class of X. So nu n of X, right? So the way you apply this is you sort of write it as I n star of X comma uh, J n star of this equivalence class. This is the way you apply this. Now I n star of this, right? This will be an element in H n of K1. Similarly, this will be an element in H n of K2, right? And since I have this, uh, you know, a tuple where the first element belongs to H n of K1 and the second element belongs to H n of K2, I hope you agree that uh, this tuple will belong to this direct sum. So that's how this new n map is defined. Okay, so let me pause here for a second or two. If you have any questions, please ask. How is this new n function defined? Please let me know if you have any questions. I'll pause here because if you don't understand this, uh, rest of the things are going to be hard. But uh, 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 you know, this is just a bunch of notation. There is nothing complicated that is happening. Okay. Let me know if you have any questions. Yes, Jacob, please go ahead. I n must be a homomorphism, right? Can you repeat? Is I n a homomorphism? Is that your question? No. Yeah. So let's try to see what is I n. So I n takes an element in C n of L and maps it to the same element in C n of K1. So your question is, is this I n over here? Is it a vector space homomorphism or not? Do you agree? That's your question, right? Mm, so let's just yes. verify that. So let's try to verify if you had two chains C plus C prime. Is this okay? Okay. Now I hope you agree that CN of L is a vector space. So C plus C prime will be another chain. Do you agree? Yes. 
Now, what is I n of C plus C prime? It is just C plus C prime. Do you agree? Ah, yes, yes. And this is trivially I n of C plus I n of C prime. No, C prime. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you agree that you know, and in this way you can verify the other condition as well, and you can trivially check that I n is a vector space homomorphism. Hmm? Yes, sir. And I am claiming that since uh, this is a chain map, it induces uh, 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 another uh, vector space homomorphism. Okay, for every n, there is a I n star which goes from H n of L to H n of K one. And similarly, there is J n star which goes from H n of L to H n of K two, right? And you put these two maps together and call that map nu n. So you give me an element in H n of L. Let's say this is the equivalence class of X. So when you apply nu n, the way you have to apply it is you think of a tuple where the first element is the output of uh, applying I n star on this equivalence class. And the second thing is the output of applying J n star on this equivalence class. Is this okay? Please let me know if you have any questions. All right. So I don't see any raised hand. So I presume that uh, at least uh, 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 you know there is a little bit of traction between what I said and what you understand, and maybe we can you know. Uh, continue from there. Okay, so this is the mayer vitoris theorem, right? So on mayer vitoris theorem, mathematically looks very complicated. However, if you dwell, uh, you know, over this statement for some time, you'll realize that it is just another statement on linear algebra. There is a bunch of vector spaces. There is a bunch of vector space homomorphisms, and you know, together the sequence is actually exact. Okay, you just have to understand how to apply these vector space homomorphisms. In particular, how to apply this nu n and nu n minus one. OK, so that is all, the only thing that is important. OK, so now let's uh, uh, you know appreciate the uh, consequence of the of this sequence being exact. OK, so this sequence continues, uh, 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 you know, forever, both in the, uh, uh, you know, in this direction as well as this direction. OK, but what we will do is we will not look at this entire thing, but only focus on a part of this. So uh, a part which is made up of five vector spaces, right? So uh, 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 we know that this sequence of vector spaces. If this is exact, then in a previous uh, uh, class, we sort of uh, uh, saw that, you know, this sequence being exact means that there is another sequence that is a short exact sequence, right? So let's try to recall what it was. So here what I'm saying is you have these five vector spaces and let's say uh, there are two vector space. I mean, there is a vector space homomorphism everywhere, but, uh, uh, you know, to state this result, we only need to explicitly uh, 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 label the home vector space homomorphism over here and over here, right? So then the result states that if this sequence is exact, then there is a short exact sequence. So in a short exact sequence, the boundary vector spaces are the trivial vector spaces. And here you have co-kernel of eta 4. This vector space comes down as it is. This vector space you replace by kernel of eta 1. Okay, and what is this co-kernel of uh, uh, eta 4? So co-kernel of eta 4 is precisely a 3 quotient with image of eta 4. Okay, so that's what the co-kernel of eta 4 actually means. So this is a short exact sequence, right? So uh, uh, what I'll do is now, uh, uh, you know, I will sort of state some relation, uh, uh, you know, in relation to the short exact sequence that we just discussed. Okay, and uh, uh, we will use this to somehow relate to the mayer vitoris theorem and uh, you know uh, derive a relation amongst the dimensions or the betty numbers of different dimensions of m l k1 k2 okay so that's our goal uh, uh, you know in the remaining 15 minutes or so right so let's try to go over it step by step okay so there is a typo over here this should be dimension of a3 right so let's try to uh, uh, have I written? So this is this, and this should be image of eta four, right? So let's try to understand this first relation over here. So co-kernel of eta four is a three quotiented with image of eta four. So this is the de uh, definition of co-kernel of eta four, right? So this is just a notation, which means that you take this quotient of this vector space a three with image of eta four. That's it. So the dimension of the co-kernel. Right, dimension of the co-kernel of eta 4 must equal the dimension of A3 minus the dimension of kernel of eta 4. Uh, what have I written? Uh, I think I 
made some mistakes over here. Okay, okay, I think I should do this properly. <clears throat> so let's do this properly. Okay, uh, I think the statement follows us as, uh, as in this fashion. Okay, so let's recall that. Uh, if you have a short exact sequence, right? We had derived in one of our classes previously that the dimension of the vector space in between must be the sum of dimensions of vector spaces to its side. Is this OK? So this is what we had derived in one of our previous classes. And now what we have is we have uh, something like this that uh, a zero co kernel of eta four a two kernel of eta one. OK, this is a short exact sequence, right? This is what we have. So from this it follows that, OK, from this it follows that the dimension of the vector space in between, which is dimension of A2 over here, this must equal the dimension of co kernel of eta 4 plus the dimension of kernel of eta 1, right? So uh, this relation just follows from the fact that, you know, something is a short exact sequence. So from this it follows that these this relation must be true, right? And now uh, from the definition of co kernel of eta 4, right, uh, uh, which is the quotient of A3 with the image of eta 4, right? This is what is the definition of kernel of eta 4. It follows that the dimension of co kernel of eta 4 must be dimension of A3 minus dimension of image of eta 4. OK, so this just follows from the definition of co kernel of eta 4 and the fact that uh, dimension of a uh, quotient vector space equals the dimension of uh, uh, you know the original vector space and the vector space and the dimension of the vector space with 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 uh, which you are taking the quotient operation right so this uh, relationship follows from that fact right and uh, separately from the rank nullity theorem it follows that uh, uh, you know whenever you have a, a function like this so let's say you have a4 right and you have eta4 over here right then the rank nullity theorem says that the dimension of this original vector space must equal the dimension of the kernel of this map plus the dimension of image of this map. OK, so this is what is the rank nullity theorem, right? And hence, by combining all these relations, by combining all these relations, it follows that the dimension of A2, which I have copied directly over here. OK, so the dimension of co kernel of eta 4. So I have replaced this by dimension of A3 minus dimension of image of eta 4, right? Uh, so just one minute, huh? I think I'm missing something. Huh. So this dimension of A3, I write it as it is over here. The dimension of image of eta 4, I replace by dimension of A4 minus dimension of kernel of eta 4. So this thing comes directly over here. So let me just copy this. So this thing comes directly over here, right? And then, um, so let's see uh, what happens. So this thing over here comes directly over here, okay? And uh, this part over here, okay, this part is being replaced by dimension of A3. So let me just do that. So dimension of A3 minus dimension of image of eta 4. So this is what I replace over here, okay? But this dimension of image of eta 4 is also satisfying this relation. So I substitute all of this in this and I finally end up with this relation over here. OK, so this is some algebra, but uh, you know, uh, if you sort of do it carefully, you will be able to see that this relationship actually holds true. OK, so let me pause here. Uh, if there are any questions or if you didn't understand any of these steps, OK, please let me know. I'd be happy to explain. Do you have any questions on this relationship? OK, so this just follows by using these three relations over here. So if you understand how each of these three relations was obtained, OK, you should be able to figure out, uh, you know, how to obtain this relationship over here, right? So uh, 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 the consequence of this is that whenever you have, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, exact sequence of the following kind. So let me just write that thing again. So whenever you have an exact sequence of the following kind, then such a relationship must hold, 
right? So this sort of says that the dimension of this vector space must equal the dimension of this vector space minus the dimension of uh, this vector space over here plus the dimension of kernel of this and the dimension of kernel of this, right? So such a relationship holds. And now, if you recall in this uh, uh, mayer vitoris theorem, we had such a sequence, right? And uh, now if you sort of uh, uh, substitute each of them, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, like think of what should be A4, think of what should be A3, think of what should be A2, A1 and A0. If you sort of substitute and make use of this relation, you will end up uh, uh, with this, uh, 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 you know, this result over here. OK, so this is the result that is of use to us. So let us try and read this result. So what this result says that the nth Betty number of M equals the nth Betty number of K1 plus the nth Betty number of K2 minus the nth Betty number of L plus dimension of kernel of mu n plus dimension of kernel of mu n minus 1, right? So at the end of the day, if you did not understand what is this mayer vitoris theorem doing and so on, how is it useful? Well, the answer to all such questions is that, well, the mayer vitoris theorem at the end of the day enables us to derive this relationship over here. And as you can see over here, this relationship uh, sort of relates the nth Betty number of this uh, simplicial complex M. So recall what M was. This was K1 union K2 and L was K1 intersection K2, right? Uh, uh, so this is how uh, uh, the Betty numbers of these different entities are actually related to each other. Is this okay? So now what I'll do is I'll give a very quick proof of this. It's not at all hard. We just have to make use of this star relation over here. Right, so let's try to appreciate how to do this. So uh, from the mayer vitoris theorem, we had these uh, uh, sequence of uh, uh, five vector spaces. Okay, so this is the portion that I had highlighted in that sequence. Okay, so this, uh, 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 you know, sequence of five vector spaces is an exact sequence, right? So now what you have to do is you have to basically use this relationship over here. So the role of A2 is actually played by this. Right, so uh, uh, you have to look at the dimension of A2, which is dimension of Hn of M. Right, so the dimension, so the nth homology group of M. If you look at its dimension, this is precisely beta n of M. Right, so you can see that this and this is exactly what you have over here. Right, so then you have dimension of A3. So what is dimension of A3? So this is the, uh, so this is A5. This is sorry. This is A4. This is A3, this is A2, this is A1, this is A0. So what is dimension of A3? Now, if you have uh, a, a direct sum of two vector spaces, then the dimension of the direct sum equals the sum of these different dimensions, right? So uh, consequently, uh, uh, the dimension of A3 must equal beta n of K1 plus beta n of K2, right? Now, let's, uh, let's see what is this. This is dimension of kernel of eta 1, right? So eta 1 is what appears over here. So this is precisely what will lead to a dimension of kernel of uh, uh, new n minus 1, right? And similarly, you have uh, this kernel of eta 4. So that is what will lead to dimension of kernel of new n, right? And finally, you have this dimension of a4. So a4 over here is this. So the dimension of this is precisely beta n of n, right? So just by uh, uh, substituting, uh, you know, what a4 is, what a2 is and so on, and using this relation, you will be able to use, uh, obtain this statement stated in the corollary. So let me pause here for a second or two. Let me know if you have any questions on how we derive this relationship over here. Do you have any questions? All right, so I don't see any raised hand. So let us now discuss the last claim of uh, today's class. OK, so you will sort of see how we can, uh, you know, apply this mayer vitoris theorem to our context and eventually be able to discuss this incremental algorithm by this Delfinado and Edels Brunner. OK, so here is a claim which uh, in some sense trivially follows from this corollary that we stated before. Right, so the claim goes as follows. Let delta be a simplicial complex on some vertex set V. Okay, so let delta be a simplicial complex on some vertex set V. And suppose sigma is a subset of V, right? Such that 
sigma has p plus 1 vertices right so let's say sigma is made up of v0 all the way up till vp okay so sigma has p plus 1 vertices and further suppose that this sigma does not belong to k however its boundary faces all lie in k right so this belongs to cp minus 1 of k so an example of this would be something like this so let's say you have uh, so this is the simplicial complex this is what is delta and let's say you had an edge so let's say this is uh, uh, v0 v1 v2 and let's say you had an edge v0 v2 so if this is your simplicial complex clearly it does not include this face however you can see that if you look at the boundary of this uh, uh, edge over here right so if you write down uh, daba 1 of uh, v0 v2 i hope you agree that this will be v0 plus v2 right this is what you will end up with now my claim is that even though uh, 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 daba uh, daba 1 of this uh, 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 you know uh, like v0 v2 does not lie in this face you can clearly see that its boundary elements are there in the simplicial complex so in particular you can see that v0 plus v2 this is something that is already there in uh, 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 you know in this uh, c0 of this simplicial complex right so that is what this statement over or this condition over here means the face does not belong to the simplicial complex however all its boundary faces belong to this simplicial complex so think of this example over here then this result states the following whenever you have such a scenario and you add this face to delta whenever you have such a scenario that sigma does not belong to delta however its boundary faces belong to delta and if you add add this sigma to delta then the following things could occur for every j that is not in this set p1 p minus 1 and p the betty numbers are preserved that is after you add sigma whatever is the jth betty number this exactly equals the jth betty number that was there before furthermore what happens to the p minus 1th and pth betty number if some condition holds which i will discuss in the next class then the pth betty number increases by 1 and the p minus 1th betty number remains the same and on the other hand if this condition fails then the p minus 1th betty number decreases by 1 and the pth betty number remains the same right so the uh, uh, usefulness of this result is the following let's say you had this simplicial complex and you wanted to add an edge right so we are sort of saying does this edge satisfy some condition if it satisfies some condition then it will increase betty 1 if it doesn't satisfy this condition it will decrease uh, uh, betty 0 right and all other betty numbers will be preserved okay so that is in some sense what is this theorem trying to tell us and this uh, uh, will follow from the meyer vitoris uh, uh, theorem that we just discussed and this is a claim that you have to really understand and uh, be able to apply okay and this application and its uh, 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 different uh, way to interpret this claim okay we will discuss this in the next class okay so let me stop today's discussion thank you uh, let me stop recording if you have any questions i'll be available